All right, so welcome to our very first lecture, study group, whatever you want to call it for Microbiology 1. I always call it a study group, but technically, I guess it's the lecture that's going to occur every week. This way, you guys will still get a lecture um, given to you. I find that it's very difficult to learn some of this content without lecturing through it. Now, I will use the PowerPoints that are in each week in the lesson tabs to go through when we lecture. I will warn you, I do talk pretty fast. I've been told that many times that I'm a very fast talker. The good news is that we record all of these. And so you can go back, I'll post them in the classroom, in the online section. You can listen to them as many times as you want and you can pause me. So if I'm talking way too fast and you like need to catch up in notes or whatever it might be, then you just simply can pause me that way. And so we will do this for all of our study groups and then we'll also have exam review sessions. So I will do three normal exam review sessions and then a final exam review session and those are going to be on Sundays instead of Mondays. And so all of this is in the calendar in the main course. Now when I go to put the recording up, if you go into your main course under lessons, there is going to be a page called study groups slash review session recordings, something to that effect. It'll be the very first item under lessons. You are going to find that I put every recording on that page. I'll also put it in the announcements, but if you want an easy place to quick access any recording, it's going to be on that page under the lessons tab. So just keep that in mind. That's what that is going to be for. All right, so we are going to get started here pretty quick. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that you guys can see what PowerPoints and stuff I'm using at what time so you can follow with. Um, just one note, if you do ever want to get a hold of me for anything, I mean, if you need to talk via phone um, or just, you know, via web, if we want to set up a meeting through my WebEx link here, we can always do that. I'm more than happy to meet with anybody. Just keep in mind that my time zone is different. I do live in Arizona. Um, so we are currently on California time. So I'm on the Pacific time, line, um, time zone right now. So I am two hours behind you. So like right here, it's seven o'clock. For you guys, it's nine o'clock. So um, just keep that in mind if you do want to call me or anything like that, there is a time zone difference. Otherwise, that shouldn't affect us at all. I still grade everything that you do on a central time zone. So nothing else gets affected by that. Okay, so we did not do a dis uh, study group last week. We skipped last week just because it was the first week to the course. Everybody was getting adjusted. There was a couple PowerPoints last week that were in there for material. And so the first one is here. It's called Bacterial Genetics and Metabolism. So we will just start with this, and we're going to work through, unfortunately, five PowerPoints today just to get make sure that we're up to date with where we need to be. So it could be longer one this evening. All right, so overall, microbiology is the study of microorganisms, and there are four microorganisms, bacteria, parasites, fungi, and viruses. So let's just discuss a little bit on um, each one. Bacteria are unicellular organisms. They're considered prokaryotes. Prokaryotes mean that they do not have a nucleus. They do not have mitochondria. They don't have endoplasmic reticulum. They don't have any organelles. So they are not your typical cells or anything like that that you think of that have nucleus and organelles. They are missing all that, so they are considered prokaryotes. A parasite is considered a eukaryote. They can be unicellular or multicellular, so they will have nucleus and organelles present with them. Fungi, same thing. They are eukaryotes. They obtain nutrients, in this case through absorption. We will have two categories of fungi, yeast and molds, and we will discuss mycology, which is the study of fungus, in microbiology to week one. So you guys will learn the different clinically significant fungi in week one of micro two. Viruses are the smallest of the four categories. They are not able to be seen under a normal, regular microscope. They're not considered either prokaryote or eukaryote. They are actually um, acellular, and they are basically not living. They are considered, I guess, for all intents and purposes, dead. Um, and they require the host cell for replication. They do have DNA or RNA in them, but they're not going to have both. They are either going to be a DNA-based virus or they're going to be an RNA-based virus. 
So that is part of knowing viruses. Um, it's just knowing, you know, what's their makeup that way. Now, there has been some studies done recently, and I know a student in my last class um, pointed this out, and I thought it was awesome, that there have been studies done recently that they have found that maybe viruses aren't totally not living as much as we've always said they are. We've always said, oh, they're not living, they're not living. But there has been some, in, you know, research into maybe there's more to it than that. But for now, we're still considering them not living. All right, within microbiology, we name everything, of course. We use a taxonomy system to help classify our organisms, the nomenclature, which is the naming, and aid in identification. We do this because that way, wherever you go in the world, if we are talking about Staphylococcus aureus, we are all talking about the same Staph aureus. So it just makes it consistent. So within that taxonomy, there is, of course, your lovely kingdom, division, class, order, family, genus, species, something you probably remember way back in maybe biology in high school. Um, as far as we're concerned with these microbes, we are only concerned with genus and species. Uh, I don't care about any of the rest of it. The rest of it's too broad. We are just going to get down into the genus and species level of all of our microbes. All right. So. Basically, a species is going to be your basic taxonomic group. They're going to share very similar traits. And then you can even get more specific and go subspecies and sub um, group. Basically, that's a subgroup of species. One second here. Hold on one second. I just want to do something real quick. Okay. All right, and then beyond the subspecies, you can actually stereotype your bacteria. So if you think of it this way, genus is going to be like their last name, if you will, but it's the first name, kind of. It's kind of backwards. It's like, oh, Staphylococcus is a genus. So there's many Staphylococcus in that genus. And then the species whittles it down even more narrow. Oh, you're Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, and then you can have a subspecies of that Staphylococcus aureus. So you kind of get the drill there. All right, so this just talks about genus there, the definition of that. So at any rate, they only put bacteria into these groupings that share very similar traits and characteristics. All right, nomenclature, again, we have a tuning system. We will always refer to a organism by its genus and species name. It is spelled and written just the way I have highlighted there. So if you were to do a research project and you need to t write about, um, I don't know, Klebsiella pneumoniae, you're going to type it out just like this. It should be italicized. The first genus name should be capitalized, the species um, not capitalized, essentially. So it should always be kind of written that way. All right, and then finally, identification. Many bacteria have all these different traits. They have different enzymes. We have different tests that we can run to look for those enzymes. These are the things that you are going to learn this quarter, next quarter, on how to figure out what bacteria we have, what is causing their infection. So identification will be based on either their genotypic characteristics or their phenotypic characteristics. So remembering back to biology, genotypic is talking about genetic makeup, geno for genetics, their DNA's composition, that kind of thing. Phenotypic is what can you see, what can you observe. So on a person, a phenotype would be, oh, they have blue eyes, blonde hair. On a bacteria, it's going to be, oh, what did they look like when they grew on the auger plates? Oh, they were large, creamy, white. Um, what did they gram stain with? One of the staining characteristics, they were grandpa's rods. You know, oh, they were anaerobes. They did not want oxygen. Those are considered phenotypic characteristics of bacteria. All right, so the overall genetics is the next part of this PowerPoint, bacterial genetics. And this is essentially the bacteria's ability to survive. Bacteria are just like us. They want to survive. They want to do everything they can to survive. So this is their ability to adapt, multiply, cause disease, do whatever they like to do is their job. So there are three major aspects of microbial genetics. 
You have the structure and organization of their material, the replication process, and then the mechanism in which they exchange information amongst other bacteria. So here's a little bit more on those three aspects. So the nucleic acid structure and organization, of course, this is talking about DNA and RNA. So this just kind of goes through what's a nucleotide, you know, what, do, what makes up a genetic code, what's, you know, that kind of thing. So this should hopefully be review for you guys back from biology, A and P, something like that. So just know that a base sequence will be put together to make the genetic code. All right, every DNA molecule has two nucleotide strands. Each has a five prime and three prime terminal, and then you have bases that pair together. This is, again, all review. Some other terms that you'll see, gene is a DNA sequence for a specific product. A genome is all those genes together. And then finally, those genomes can be categorized or organized into chromosomes. There are things that are considered non-chromosomal elements, and that would be a plasmid. I definitely would know this. I would take this away for sure, that a plasmid, otherwise known as a mini chromosome, um, is not a true chromosome in that sense. It's a smaller, still able to replicate, still able to encode, very similar to a chromosome, but it's not as stable. So just keep that in mind that a plasmid sometimes will possess genes as well. All right, next aspect was the replication and expression of this genetic information. So bacteria will multiply by cell division, so they will basically make two daughter cells from one parent cell. As part of that process, they are, of course, replicating their genome. So each daughter cell will receive at least um, one strand of that DNA from the parent. So this just goes through how they receive that strand. I'm not going to review this for now. We have a lot to get through. It's background information right now. To express it, their genetic information, they have transcription and translation. Again, background information review processes here. You can read through that later on your own. And then finally, we always have control. Anytime in your body, there's always stuff that's placed there to be in control of that process. So in hematology, there's things that are in place for the coagulation system. In immunology, there's things that are in place for the complement system. There's always things that are trying to be in place to have control. Same with gene expression. So you can have regulation or control at different levels. So usually it's one of these three levels down there at the bottom. Now, the important part is we've all heard how bacteria can mutate and change, and that's where we can see the genetic change or the sharing amongst information. So basically, bacteria will achieve genetic diversity um, because they can't achieve it through cell division. That doesn't really give us genetic diversity. It doesn't let it evolve and, you know, become better or grow beyond a situation, but they can achieve genetic diversity through either mutation, genetic recombination, or gene exchange. So a mutation is simply where you change their nucleotide sequence, so that would change the entire gene. That would also change the entire genotype. So just by mutating a nucleotide sequence, it has major impact to how that bacteria is set up. Genetic recombination is where you take a piece of DNA from one bacteria and you exchange it with a DNA segment of another bacteria. So they're just swapping DNA, essentially. And then finally, there is a physical gene exchange as well of DNA that can occur through many different ways here, either through transformation, transduction, or conjugation. So again, this is what the bacteria does to ensure genetic diversity and to make sure that they survive that they can beat whatever they need to beat. That's why bacteria have become mutated and resistant to drugs, to antibiotics. They've learned how to fight that drug off and, and they've learned what it takes to change enough so that that drug doesn't work anymore. And that's how they're doing it. All right, and then finally, metabolism. What does a bacteria do to give itself energy to go through all of its processes? Because again, they don't have a nucleus and they don't have organelles. So they have to do this 
somehow. So they have a fueling process that they can do in which they will produce energy. So this is just talking about how they take in nutrients across the cell wall. They have the breakdown of the chemical energy via different reactions. There's biosynthesis in which they will use that fueling reaction to kind of bring together different items and start putting them together. That's where polymerization and assembly occurs, where they put the things together. This last four slides were pretty much just that background at this point. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me say that. <laughs> All right. Structure and function of bacteria cell. This is where we start getting more into the microbiology piece. Again, bacteria is prokaryotic. They don't have organelles, but what their cell wall does have is a very important component called peptidoglycan, and you can see it bolded there. We will hear more about this peptidoglycan when we begin discussing our gram staining process. Eukaryotes are going to be the others, the parasites and the fungus, plant cells, animal cells, all of those are considered eukaryotic. And a reminder, viruses are again acellular, they're not part of either of those categories, and they depend upon the host cells for survival. Okay, so this is where we get juicy. Now in your first week, you already looked at some gram stains, so you already got a feel for gram paws, gram neg, and shapes. So this kind of reviews that again. So the cell wall differences is what makes either one a gram positive or a gram negative. That's the difference between a pause from a neg is how that cell wall is made. And again, gram stain is like by far the most, like it says, your fundamental test in bacterial identification. Essentially, the minute that we grow bacteria on an auger plate, this is the very first test we always, always, always run. We need to know what the gram stain is because based on the gram stain, it will tell us what next test should be. We test our organisms based on if they're gram positive or gram negative. So in other words, we're not doing, some tests will cross over into both, but the order that we do it is different between the two categories. We will run different tests on gram positives that we may not run on gram negatives and vice versa. So gram stain is always by far the very first step that we take because it will begin whittling it down to what can be possibly causing that infection. So gram positives, as you saw, were deep purple color. Sometimes people say deep blue and gram negatives are pink or red coloring. And then the other part of reading a gram stain is reading the shape that you see. It can be a coxie, which is a round ball. It could be a coccobacilli, in which it kind of looks between a coxie and a rod, where it's like that ovally shape. Or it could be a bacillus, what you call a rod. Whenever you report gram stain, especially in my class, I want the full shebang. A lot of people report gram stains as, oh, it's just gram positive. Well, gram pos what? Was it a gram pos coxie? Was it a gram pos rod? Those are two very different things. And, two, and many different types of bacteria belong in each category. So we need the full thing. You need both the gram stain reaction and the shape. So I want to hear gram pos coxie, gram negative rod, gram pos rod, you know, that kind of thing. All of it put together really helps identify what you have. And then while you're looking at the gram stain, sometimes you'll notice certain things like to occur in pairs or if they chain or cluster. And we'll see that as we begin learning bacteria later on, we'll start talking about when that does happen. All right, so here's a little bit more on those cell walls and what makes them different between a gram positive from a gram negative. So gram negatives will have an outer membrane that the gram positives don't have and they will have periplasm. But the true difference between a gram negative and a gram positive is that peptidoglycan layer. In gram positive bacteria, peptidoglycan is much thicker and it will contain tocoic acid crosslinks. The two together, the thickness of that peptidoglycan and those tocoic acids will really retain the crystal violet purple color. And that's why gram positives are purple. They really retain it, it embeds right down into the thick wall so that it never is rinsed away and it always stays purple. Gram negatives have a much thinner cell wall or a much thinner layer of peptidoglycan, so they can easily wash off that purple color and that's why they are not purple. So we will talk through the gram stain process here in a PowerPoint coming up in tonight and we'll discuss that again. All right, so some other components that are found in the bacteria 
are talking about the endospores. Some bacteria are able to form spores. When we learn about these bacteria, we'll be sure to point them out. There's not a ton of them that can form spores, but there are a few that we will discuss eventually. And then nutritional factors for growth. So whenever we receive a specimen, we're plating them onto what we call auger plates. And these auger plates have nutrients in there to allow the bacteria to grow. And we're putting it in an environment that it loves. Usually it's 37 degree body temp. So it's nice and warm and you know we're putting it in an environment that it will really thrive and grow for us. So bacteria need nutrition just like anybody else to keep growing. Carbon and energy are the biggest things that they want and proteins. So that media or auger that we use will give them that. Now there are some bacteria that are considered fastidious and this is a term that I want you very familiar with. Fastidious bacteria are basically really picky. They're, they want extra. The regular nutritional things are not good enough. They want more. So they want to be in gro like growing on enriched media, things, media that's going to have extra stuff in there to allow them to grow. So just know that fastidious are very picky. All right, so you can either use a liquid, what we call broth media, or you can use an auger, which is solid. Most of the time we're using augers. Um, there is one broth that's really commonly used. Otherwise, most of the time we're always using an auger in the lab. And then here are some various um, incubator temperatures and environment conditions that bacteria like. Most bacteria, again, want body temp, which is 35 to 37. There is a bacteria called Campylobacter jejuni. I don't have the second part on here. He wants it extra warm, and I would remember this. I'd highlight it, bold it, whatever you need to do. So Campylobacter jejuni, or just you can say Campylobacter for now, likes to grow at 42 degrees Celsius. So if we're ever looking for him, a lot of times there's a separate incubator that we can put him in to make sure it's extra warm for him. And then as far as some environment condition, again, if you're an aerobic bacteria, you like oxygen, you want oxygen around. Anaerobes and for without, they do not want anything to do with oxygen. However, you might hear a term called facultative anaerobes. Those are ones that can grow within or without oxygen. So facultative basically meaning they can go in or out, it doesn't matter. But if they are a strict anaerobe, they absolutely cannot have oxygen. Capnophiles, files for loving, capno for carbon dioxide, they love carbon dioxide. So you will see increased amounts of CO2 to help grow these. So these bacteria ideally want 5 to 10% CO2 and 15% oxygen. So the oxygen is still normal levels, but they want the CO2 kicked up more. Whereas microaerophiles, meaning micro for small, air for air, means they want reduced oxygen with that increased CO2. So they will lower, whoa, what am I doing? <laughs> they will lower the oxygen down to 5 to 10% and then still increase that CO2. So these are very similar, but there is enough to tell them apart. So again, capnophiles increase CO2, but they leave the oxygen up there at 15. Microaerophiles, they lower the oxygen and increase the CO2. So just be familiar with those four environmental conditions. All right, so we are done with our first one. Let's move on to our second one from week one, which was infection control and micro. A lot of this is safety stuff, but there is some new stuff in here that I want you to be take away. So here is the overall four stages of microbial to human interaction. So what happens between basically a bacteria and a person? So first stage, you always have that physical encounter, however they are picking it up. Second stage is that microbe can colonize on the surface, meaning it survives. Third stage is it looks for a way to get in. How can it enter? How can it evade? How can it disseminate? Meaning how can it really spread disease? How does it evade our immune system? And then fourth is the outcome. What disease did you get? What infection did you kind of get? That kind of thing. All right, so some terms that you should know. On every bacteria we learn, every bacteria has known reservoirs where they like to be found. So these reservoirs can be like, oh, this bacteria is always in water. This one's always in soil, food, air, humans, animals. So we'll always kind of reference a reservoir on many of the bacteria. Mode of transmission is how do they get to the person. And that can be through a vector, which is a living thing, like a mosquito, 
or a tick. Those are living things that will transfer um, different parasites and bacteria. Or it could be through a fomite, and a fomite is a non-living thing. That would be the countertop, the doorknob, your cell phone, you know, whatever. It could be something that somebody sneezed on and left it on there, and then you come along and touch it. So that's a non-living transfer. All right. As far as humans directly acquiring microbes for another human, there is that possibility. Humans can act as reservoirs. So some examples here would be a newborn passing through the birth canal that has multiple microbes and possibly picking up one of those upon birth. Another example is getting it through blood transfusion, sexual contact, that kind of thing. You can have animals as reservoirs. So a lot of times if an animal bites you or if you're frequently handling animals, like say you're in a veterinarian role or you're a farmer or something and you pick it up from handling that animal, um, there's that way. So anytime you think of an animal disease, it's usually referred to as a zoonotic infection. So those are infections that are seen in humans but primarily are coming from an animal microbe. And again, we've already said this before, but microbes' perspective is they're going to survive. They'll do what they need to take do to survive. All right, so colonization is definitely a term that I want you familiar with, and it's referring to the persistent survival of microbes on the surface of the body. And again, that is the very first step that bacteria can really take to starting to look at how it can cause infection. It's looking for a way in, and it will survive and persist as much as it can. From the host perspective and the human perspective, we're of course trying to avoid it, especially with our defense. And in taking immunology, you our first line of defense our skin and mucous membrane. That protects our inside body from the outside world is skin and mucous membrane. So we're hoping that makes it enough to resist. From the bacteria perspective, they can either be considered normal flora, something that's just always a part of your system, or they can be true colonizers where they're always persistently surviving and waiting. You know, so it just depends on what setup they have. So and the entry, invasion, dissemination of the microbes, again, they must first overcome our skin and mucous membranes, our physical barriers. And then they're going to have lots of different things that they can do. Sometimes they are modal, so they move around to evade, you know, phagocytosis. Sometimes they have a capsule. Sometimes they release toxins. You know, these bacteria do all sorts of things to help make sure they can dig deeper into the tissues and avoid our immune system. So here's just a lot on the immune system, how we can respond non-specific responses versus specific responses. I do not test you on either of these slides. These are very much immunology-based slides, so when you get in immunology, if you haven't yet, you'll learn all about this. So I'm not going to worry about it for now. All right, some other terms. Of course, we know an infection and disease are very similar terms. That's any time that you have damage um, resulting to that person. It could, you know, in whatever way it is. Virulence factor. We will discuss different virulence factors of bacteria. These are the things that the bacteria can do to make sure it survives and causes disease. So like I mentioned before, those are toxins, um, capsules, the ability to move around and get around. You know, those are all typically virulence factors. So whenever I say a bacteria is really virulent, I mean they're very good at causing disease because they have enough things that they can do and they're potent enough that they really are going to cause that disease. So. Anytime the more virulence factors it has, the better that it is at what it does. So here's how it could kind of get through into deeper layers. Attachment, invasion, survival against our immune system. So we have already discussed all of this, so I'm just going to move on. And again, here are some virulence factors that bacteria have. One is toxins. There are actually two different types of toxins if you go to the bottom, endo and exo. Endotoxin is primarily released by gram-negative rods, or not rods, gram-negative bacteria, it's usually rods, but, um, and they will have an effect on your body's metabolism. Exotoxin is more produced by gram-positive bacteria. It's a little bit more limited, it's not as um, 
encompassing as an endotoxin. This is kind of interesting though. A lot of people have heard about getting food poisoning from different bacteria. You don't always need the bacteria to be present in the food to get food poisoning. If that bacteria was there and left behind their toxin that causes disease and you ate that food, even though the bacteria wasn't there but the toxin was, you will still get food poisoning because that toxin is there. So if they can leave behind their toxin, that will still give you the disease. So I always think that's really interesting to share. All right, and finally, outcome. The outcome of how the disease is going to be on you as a person is going to depend on your health, your overall immune system. Are you immunosuppressed? If you're immunosuppressed, you're going to have a lot harder time with it. If you're a normal, healthy adult, you probably can fight it off pretty well. It also is going to depend, though, on the virulence of the pathogen. How good is this bacteria or parasite or whatever you might have got at causing disease? We have some bacteria that are amazing at it and some that rarely ever cause disease. And then prevention-wise, even if there's a vaccination available, that's the best way to be prevented. Otherwise, hand washing is, of course, always a great way. So some other terms, and I know you guys have these on your week one study guide, so they're probably familiar by now. Sterilization is where you're having all forms of the microbe killed or destroyed. Here are some examples of sterilization and other chemical examples there. Disinfectant is where not everything is killed, but you're hoping the majority is kind of killed. Um, spores might still be able to survive, and so here's some different ways to have disinfectants as well. And hopefully you guys have already been very familiar with safety from other classes. Let's whip through this really quickly. Every lab has to have a chemical hygiene plan. In that chemical hygiene plan, it discusses that every single item has an MSDS sheet, a material safety data sheet. That sheet tells you if you get splashed with a chemical or if it gets on your skin, how do you take care of it? It also tells you how to store the chemical. You know, anything to do with that chemical, it will guide you on. And so those always have to be accessible to employees. There's, of course, fire safety, electrical safety, compressed gas safety. Um, there's also biological plans. So anytime that you may be been exposed to a needle prick or something, there is um, a stepping process that you go through to test for, to look at the exposure on what you might have been exposed to. So there's a whole exposure control plan on that. And then finally, we use engineering controls. These are things that have been manufactured to help protect us. The best example would be your biosafety cabinet, AKA a hood. Um, we already discussed there's four levels of biosafety cabinets. Based on what we're looking, working with, most hospitals always use level two, unless they have a lot more big bad pathogens that they deal with. But most of the hospitals are level two. Um, again, and these are manufactured controls to protect us from the organisms. And then finally, sometimes you have to ship things through the mail. There's a ton of policies that deal with shipping biohazardous organisms. We will not even get into that. All right, we're getting there. I know, hang on. I'm, I know I'm not that fascinating to listen to forever. All right, our next one is gonna be specimen collection and processing. This is from week two now. So next week, you will have a quiz and that quiz will cover weeks one and two. So just keep that in mind. Next week, there will be a quiz on weeks one and two. All right, so specimen collection and processing. The, the good old, uh, how do you say it, adage, adage, <laughs> the saying is your lab results are only as good as the sample collected. It's very true. You need a good quality sample, hopefully contamination free to get really nice results. Now, depending on what we're looking for, is going to be the sample we collect. And that's where it gets a little tricky in a micro, is it's not just blood we're collecting here, which that's usually for the rest of the areas they want blood. This is gonna depend on what their infection is. If they're showing up going, I have a huge nasty wound infection on my ankle, we're probably doing a wound swab, you know, and we're not collecting it, the nurses and physician are. They're gonna collect a wound swab and send it to us. If they're coming in saying, I have diarrhea, we'll collect a stool sample. If they have potential UTI, we'll collect urine. You know, so you kind of get the gist. We're gonna collect the sample for whatever their complaint is. 
Typically, we want to collect it in the acute phase of the illness before any antibiotics have been administered because we want to make sure that the bacteria grows that's causing their infection so we can identify it. All right, so Micro's department's job on this is to provide really good training, collection, and transport um, SOPs to those physician and nursing staff, making sure we talk about how to properly label, how to make sure they get it to us in time and not let it sit on a counter somewhere forever, making sure they're providing safety, that they're doing it in a sterile or aseptic technique. All of that is necessary to train our physicians and nursing staff. All right, so again, we always are trying to look for sterile containers, except for stool samples. We don't need a sterile container there. Um, there's so much bacteria in stool that you're not going to get rid of the bacteria in there. You're just looking for the main pathogens that cause diarrhea. Otherwise, there will always be bacteria in stool. Um, again, you can use swabs. Those are more for upper respiratory tract. If you think like influenza testing goes up your nose, um, ears, eyes, genital tracts. And you can have different swab types. They will affect the organisms dependent. You don't want to use just like your cotton Q-tip swab because those will actually contain fatty acids that will kill the organism. So we want to have specific swabs that will help make sure that the organisms stay intact so when we go to grow them, they'll grow. Urine, preferably we will do a clean catch midstream. The problem with clean catchment stream is that patients get confused easily. You need to make sure you have really clear directions on how to do it, that they wipe really well enough to cleanse themselves, that they start going into the toilet, then they collect midstream. Um, older people get really confused by this, but the, the hope is that they cleanse themselves well enough that there's not like a ton of contamination coming from their skin. Urine is easily contaminated. Um, first morning specimen may be preferred because it's really concentrated, but again, if they're not cleansing themselves, they're going to get a bunch of contaminants. And then, of course, catheters are always a great thing if they're done aseptically. Sputum, sputum is that big, deep lung loogie. It's just nasty. Oh my gosh. It's like a big mucus ball. And it is usually collected to assess lower respiratory tract infections, usually like pneumonia. Um, it's a horrible sound they make when they collect it. I can't stand the sound people make when they're spitting that up. And then you get in the lab and it's like a ball of mucus in a cup and you got to play with that ball of mucus and it's just, that is the one thing that can get to me, is trying to string out this mucus across the slide and onto auger. I can't wait till you guys see it. It's great fun. So, all right. Stool, of course, we're looking to detect different gastrointestinal pathogens. Um, sometimes you can use a rectal swab, but if you're collecting a stool sample, you want three specimens over several days, especially if you're also looking for parasites. That is commonly ordered together. If we have somebody coming in going, I've had mad diarrhea for like five days, usually the doctor will order both a stool culture and a parasite exam. They usually call it an O&P, OVA and parasite, because we're looking for any bacteria or parasite that's causing um, that, di that diarrhea. So typically, we'll have more sensitivity if we collect three samples. We'll have more luck of trying to figure out what it was. And then transport. Again, these cannot sit out on the counter. If you let any sort of container with a sample sit on the counter, that bacteria multiplies, like unreal. If you let urine sit on the counter for a few hours, all of a sudden, the bacteria multiplied unbelievably in there. So we don't want that to happen. We want to analyze all of this, um, not analyze it, but we want to set all of this up to culture plates and put it in the incubator as soon as possible before anything has sat too long and been falsely multiplied out of control. So again, ideally within two hours of collection, sometimes sooner than that. Containers should be leak-proof, of course. Put in special bags to make sure that there's no potential for leaking anywhere. There are sometimes preservatives that we use in urine. We definitely use preservatives in stool. Um, so those are listed there. And we also have some transport media listed down here for you. Of course, if we're looking for blood, we do screen for blood cultures. We will collect it with blood. Now, we always have to have anticoagulants anytime we do blood or body fluids because we don't want anything to clump. We want the blood if, to stay liquid. So in blood cultures, we have an anticoagulant called SPS. 
That is the main anticoagulant for blood cultures. We are not using any EDTA, any sodium citrate, anything like that here. So this is telling you the preferred storage of these items. Um, so you have your refrigerate side and you have your room temp side there. You'll notice the room temp side is primarily swabs for the most part. There's a few other extras in there too. And then labeling. So we all have learned phlebotomy, or hopefully we have, that on a label you should have the patient name, the date of birth, the time and date collected, and the phlebotomist initials. Those are the five normal things. In micro, we require a little bit more than just those five things. We also want to know source. So where is this coming from? You know, if we get a swab, I don't know what the heck that swab is unless you tell me. Because that swab could either be a wound infection or it could be an ear infection, it could be an eye infection. I don't know unless I get the source. And the reason the source is big is we have different pathogens in each of those areas. What I might look for in the ear infection is completely different than what I might look for, say, in a, I don't know, a rectal swab. You know, they're completely different pathogens. So the source is really huge. And then you can always put extra information on the requisition. If they've had antibiotics already or not, that's important to know if something will grow right. So things like that. And then when it's received in the lab, of course, we mark in or log it into the computer for the date and time received. There isn't too many things that are considered stat in the micro world because it takes time. You have to grow these organisms out on plates, and that's at least a 24-hour growth. So you can see that stat's a little hard. The only things we can really do stat are gram stains right away to tell them if we do see anything in a gram stain. That can be stun stat. Otherwise, stat's a little tricky. So prioritizing the specimens is a little trickier because there just isn't that stat item. And then specimen rejection, we do have rules why we would reject a specimen. Primarily, this involves mislabeling. That's the number one reason I've always seen specimens rejected is either they really mislabeled the specimen, like a common example is they put the urine cup label on the lid. That's a huge no-no because you don't know if you got lids mixed up with another urine. Um, another common rejection would be if it, they didn't get it down to us in time, if it had been sitting on their counter too long upstairs or wherever they are downstairs, I don't care. If it sat on their counter too long, they did get us to us in the time that they shut up. And then finally, another one would be inadequate quantity. Say we got a stool sample in, but there's hardly anything in there to work with, that we couldn't work with it. Okay, so that was specimen collection. Two more left. Now we're gonna, these last two to me are probably the majority of your test questions are going to be out of these last two. So, because these really will start directly applying to what we're going to be doing in lab from now on out. So, the first one here that we're going to go through out of the last two is called microscopic examination. This is where we begin discussing gram stains, what's involved in a gram stain, and then there's some other stains that we need to go through. So, of course, there is different types of microscopy in microbiology. Brightfield is the one that we commonly use. That's what we're using right now in our labs. Um, so it's just our normal microscope. A couple um, terms that come away from this. You can determine a total magnification, remember, by multiplying the objective lens with the ocular lens. So just keep that in mind. Anytime you hear the word resolution, that's just talking about the clarity of the image. I'm so sorry, my dog is squeaking his toy, if you can hear that. <laughs> Um, and then remember, anytime we stain something, we always look at it under 100x oil, so we want to use immersion oil for that purpose. Okay, so staining methods, you, of course, place onto a clean slide, let it dry, and then we have to fix it. And we're fixing it to make sure when we go to stain it, it doesn't just wash away. So you either can fix it by heat or by a chemical method like xylene or methanol. I think in our labs we're just fixing by heat. So the gram stain, again, is going to divide the bacteria into two groups, either gram positives or gram negatives. And so just a note here, though, because the gram stain is targeting the cell wall, there are a couple bacteria that do not have cell walls, so of course they will not gram stain if they do not have a cell wall. 
that's the only mention. And we'll learn those, I think, toward the end of this quarter. All right, so here is the steps that you need to know for gram stain and you definitely need to know. By the end of this quarter, you'll have gram stain so much this will be drilled down. So the primary stain is crystal violet. That's that dark purple stain that really embeds itself into those gram-positive bacteria because they have such a thick peptidoglycan layer. The iodine comes next. That is considered the mordant or the bind. So you let that sit on there after the crystal violet for another minute. Then you decolorize. The decolorizer is the very first step in which you can start to tell if you're gonna have a gram positive or a gram negative. So if it's a gram positive, again, that crystal violet dye will really embed down in and will not be washed away by the decolorizer. If you have a gram negative, which has a much thinner peptidoglycan layer, it will easily wash away that crystal violet. And then when you go in with your four stain saffronin, that's a red color, that will stay in the gram negative, that pink to red state color instead. So be sure you know these steps and be sure that you take away the colorizer is the step in which you begin to tell apart gram positives from gram negatives. All right, so besides, this just kind of goes through, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. This just kind of goes through again, the difference, gram positive, that thick peptidoglycan layer with tocoic acid crosslinks, and then gram negatives have that thinner layer of peptidoglycan. So here's an example. On the left is gram positive coxy. You can see their little round balls. On the right is gram negative rods. So you can definitely see the color difference between purple and pink to red. Again, we are using our 100X oil because it is a stain. So we are assessing what we look for is, again, if it's positive or negative, we look at the shape. You can look at if they're occurring more in pairs or clusters, like this on the left side with the coxie is clusters. Um, if you are doing like a sputum sample, you also are looking at the neutrophil counts and the epithelial cell count, and we'll learn that more later with sputum. So there is kind of 3D images of those morphologies. So we have coxie, and then we have rod on the right, and on the bottom, that is a spirochete. We don't have that many spirochetes. So here are some examples of bacteria that can be found under each um, gram stain. There's many, many more bacteria out there than this, but these are some common examples. This is what squamous epithelial cells would look like. If you've done anything in AMP, I think, sometimes show squamous epithelial, Hopefully these look familiar. They're always very large cells with a very little cyto, uh, nucleus in the center. Um, so that's what that is. All right, our other stain, some other stains that we're going to talk about, acid fast staining. We have a group of bacteria, especially called mycobacteria, um, that cannot stain with gram stain either. They do have cell walls but they don't have peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Instead, they have what we call mycolic acids in their cell walls. So that is why they're named mycobacteria, myco for the mycolic acids that make up their cell wall. Because they're made up differently, they do not take that gram stain. Instead, we will use acid fast stain for them. A common example that you know of for mycobacteria is tuberculosis. This is the main group of bacteria that tuberculosis comes out of. So there are two different methods for acid fasting. We have the zeal nielsen method, which we'll discuss here, and then the other method will be the Kinian method. So in the zeal nielsen again, we're fixing the smear to make sure nothing rinses off, and we only have three reagents. Our primary reagent is carbofuxin. This is like a red or dark pink color. I always think of the fuxin for fuchsia, and that reminds me it's like a really dark, bright, pink or red color. With that purple fuchsin on the side, you're going to heat it to almost boiling and then let it sit. This is kind of how it binds it in. Instead of using a mordant or iodine like we did in gram stain, they're using heat here to help bind that carbal fuchsin in. Then they have an acid decolorizer, and then finally they have methylene blue, which is their counter stain. Of course, it's blue. So anytime an acid fast or anytime a bacteria is acid fast positive, it'll be this first color, this pink to red color. If it is acid fast negative, it would be blue in color. 
All right, again, there is another method called the Kinian method. It has the exact same reagents, but what it did is it took out the heat part. It doesn't require heat anymore, and instead they use a reagent that has a higher amount of phenol in it that makes it bind better in place of that. So a lot of times people call the Zeal-Nielsen the hot method and the Kinium the cold method. And again, if it's acid fast, like mycobacteria are acid fast, they would appear red, and others would be just a blue. So there is an example of the red positive acid fast colors there. Okay, so phase contrast microscopy is done a lot of times looking for more um, fungi for our stake in microbiology. This is where you have beams of light passing through the specimen and they kind of get deflected on different things within that specimen. Fluorescent microscopy is using fluorescent dyes or what you can call fluorochromes. And there are a couple of um, some fluorochromes that I need you to know. There's actually two overall categories here it discusses and shows you how it's done. This is just background information. Here are the stains that I definitely want you to know for fluorescent stains. The first one is called acridine orange. This specifically targets and binds to nucleic acid. So basically, it will just confirm the presence of bacteria especially. It also is really great to use for cell wall deficient bacteria. If a bacteria doesn't have a cell wall, you can't gram stain it at all. You can't even acid fast stain it. But you can use an acridine orange fluorescent because it's targeting the DNA inside the bacteria instead of the cell wall. So that would help tell us or show us if those bacteria were present. And just like the name implies, it will fluoresce a bright orange, as seen there. So make sure you remember acridine orange for binding to nucleic acids. The next fluorochrome is oramine rhodamine. This will target mycolic acids. So again, it's the same group of reason why you'd use an acid fast. So you can either use acid fast stains or you can use oramine rhodamine. All of it will help identify mycobacteria because they're all targeting the mycolic acids. And again, this will also fluoresce a nice bright yellow or orange, and you can see that on the right side. And then finally, our third fluorochrome is calcifluor white. This is specifically binding the cell walls of fungus. I always think of the word calcifluor reminds me of cauliflower, and I guess to me that always kind of looks a little bit fungus-like, so that's how I've always remind, remembered that one. And you can see here it's showing some yeast cells and how they're fluoresced up. Okay. And then there is immunofluorescent techniques that are used to identify some other bacteria that are just really tricky to grow. Um, this is not something you have to remember for this. Dark field microscopy is another microscope used. Um, just like it implies, it has a very ba dark background and only the light um, only the objects inside will light up. Everything else will be black. That's why it's called dark field microscopy. The best use for this is to look for treponema pallidum. That is a spirochete, and that is what causes syphilis. So the confirmatory method for deciding if somebody has syphilis is by actually looking for treponema pallidum fluorescing under a dark field microscope. So there is what syphilis would look like under that. And then electron microscope. If you would get ever to play with one of these, I'm so jealous. They're so expensive and there's just no reason for me to ever get one or have one in CLS. But basically these are the microscopes that can enlarge um, objects to greater than 100,000 times enlargement. It's crazy how close and how visual they can see it. There's two types. They have the transmission one, which will show the inside structures. And then they have the scanning ones, which scans the outside and puts it into a 3D view. So here on the right, bottom right, would be the transmission one, which shows the internal instructors. And the one on the upper left is going to show you the scanning one, which scans the outside and puts it in a 3D image. There are some really fun um, pictures on Google, like of spiders and different nasty bugs like that close up. Like you should go see a worm. There's one that of a worm that looks like it came out of a sci-fi movie. It's crazy. Okay, and we're getting there, our last chapter. And unfortunately, this is a big guy. Um, 
Story target. Yeah, he, this is where we learn all of our different types of auger. So this is a huge um, chapter for us. Lots of information that you're going to take away out of this. All right, so bacterial cultivation is basically saying that we are growing bacteria out on an auger plate. There are three purposes to this. First, we're going to, of course, grow and isolate that bacteria that's present in a patient sample. We are going to determine what bacteria that grew is most likely causing the infection and which ones are just contamination. And then third, we are going to get enough growth so that we can identify it. We can test it with all our tests and figure out exactly which bacteria it was. So that's the purposes to bacterial cultivation. Now, we will start that by growing it out on auger. And we have four general categories in which your auger fit into. They can fit into one or two of these auger categories. So I think, do I define them on the next page? Oh, I do. So we'll start with enrichment media. Just like it sounds, it's enriched. It has additional items added to the auger. And this is especially good for fastidious organisms. Those organisms that are super picky, that want those extra nutrients, they want to grow on the enrichment need media as a result. The other category, another category here is supportive. Just as it sounds, it supports the growth of pretty much everything, almost everything. Um, the only things that it might not support the growth of are fastidious organisms since they're extra picky anyway. Otherwise, everything else should grow on a supportive media. It's there to let everything grow. A great example of this is going to be sheet blood auger. That is the number one auger we use in the lab to this day. Um, and that's just because it allows pretty much almost everything to grow except the fastidious again. And you will definitely use sheet blood auger this whole quarter. Selective media is only going to allow a certain um, type of bacteria to grow. It's only going to allow a very certain category to grow. So most of the time it's going to say it will only grow gram positives or it will only grow gram negatives. That's what it means to be selective. So an example I have here is the PEA auger only grows gram positive coxie. That's selective. It's inhibiting all the other gram negatives then. So make sure that only gram positives grow. And then our last category is differential. This is where it takes um, basically those bacteria that grew and kind of subcategorize them on other characteristics. A common characteristic that they do this with is fermentation. We have bacteria that are fermenters and then we have ones that are non-fermenters. And so they will appear differently on the plate depending on if they ferment or not. So you can see how that additional characteristic helps us further narrow down and start to identify what might be happening, what bacteria it might be. Okay, so let's get into the augers that we're going to learn for today. There's a zillion million augers out there, but we'll just talk about some of the main ones. Sheep blood auger we'll mention first since it is our primary, most commonly used auger. Again, it is supportive because it supports the growth of almost everything except that fastidious organisms. On sheep blood auger, though, they will also have hemolysis patterns appear. Now, hemolysis are where certain bacteria will have enzymes that will lyse the red cells in the auger, those blood cells that are in that auger. If they completely lyse all of those red cells around the colony, they will have an entire clearing. It will look very clear or halo-like. And that is what we call beta hemolysis. So you can see that here on the upper left. You see how it's totally clear on there. You would hold it up to light. It looks like a halo around it. That would be beta hemolysis. Alpha hemolysis is where you have a partial clearing, a partial lysis. And this will produce more of a green coloring. If you look at the pictures, that would be on the right, upper right, would be alpha hemolysis. And then finally, gamma hemolysis is just nothing. So on the bottom, you can see there's no hemolysis of any kind. It's just normal. So these hemolytic patterns will also help go toward further identification of bacteria. And so for this reason, sheep blood auger is both supportive and differential. And it's differential because you can categorize it based on these characteristics further. So supportive because it almost grows everything and differential because you can still characterize it back down into one of these three characteristics. All right, brain heart infusion auger. I don't care about this auger. I'm not going to make you learn it. 
I just mentioned the name so you know the name. So you can ignore brain heart infusion auger, I don't need this. Chocolate auger is a very commonly used auger. It basically is made up of sheep blood, just like blood auger, but what they did is they purposefully lysed the red cells in the chocolate auger. And that's why it looks chocolatey, is because these cells are lysed. It won't look like red blood anymore because they lysed the cells, so it truly looks like chocolate. And when they lysed those cells, they released all of their nutrients that were on the inside. And so they released out all this stuff. And as a result, fastidious organisms loved it. This was additional nutrients given to the auger. So fastidious organisms ate this up and really loved to grow on chocolate auger. So you can put chocolate auger in the category of enrichment. Enrichment because the lysis of those red cells actually gave it more nutrients. You can also put chocolate auger in the category of supportive. It will pretty much grow the, everything. And now it will grow fastidious as well. So it's just really good because it just does grow everything for us. Here are just two common examples of fastidious bacteria for you to take away and know for now. Neisseria species and Haemophilus species are both very common fastidious organisms that love to grow on chocolate and they will not grow on blood auger. All right, our next one is thioglycolate broth. This is one of our liquid medias in a tube. It's not in auger plates. Um, so this will look like a broth. It actually looks like chicken broth. Um, so it does have additional nutrients in here. So for that reason, it is enrichment. And it will basically support everything that will grow. So it's the categories for thioglycolate are supportive and enrichment. The interesting thing is when when things do grow in the thiobroth, sometimes they will take on unique character, growth characteristics. Now, this is not always doing this per, picture perfect, but once in a while you can see them kind of growing in a specific pattern. So if you have grandpa's coxie, sometimes it'll grow as like cloudy little balls. If you have grandnagos, that will be cloudy throughout the entire auger. If you have an anaerobe, it's only going to be cloudy at the bottom. It wants to get away from the oxygen at the top. And then finally, if you have a strict aerobe where it has to have oxygen, then it will grow only at the top and not at the bottom. So kind of here's a picture on it. Letter B there, you can see those little cloudy balls growing to represent grandpa's coxie. Letter C is just showing you the cloudy throughout diffuse. And then letter D is showing you the strict anaerobe, where it's only cloudy at the bottom, it's getting away from all the oxygen at the top. CNA auger is next. It um, stands for two antibiotics, colicin and nalidic acid. These both inhibit gram negatives, and they make sure then that only gram positive grow. So CNA auger is used to only grow gram positives. As a result, that would make it selective category. So this would be selective media, and that's the only category it fits into. PEA auger is the exact same purpose as CNA. It will also only grow gram pos coxy, so as a result, it's selective media. It will inhibit the gram negatives from growing. So most labs are only going to pick one of these two to have on hand. They're not going to have both on hand. Because they both just grow gram poses, they're going to have one of them on hand in their lab. I always used CNA when I was in the lab, so that's just what I was tend to go with, but either one works for gram pauses. McConkie auger is a selective differential auger. It says it at the very last part, bullet there. It is selectively only growing gram-negative bacilli, so gram-neg rods. It is inhibiting everything else from growing. And it's differential because those gram neg rods can be either lactose fermenters or non-lactose fermenters. So again, if you are a lactose fermenter, you will appear purple in color on the McConkie auger. If you are a non-lactose fermenter, you will appear colorless on the McConkie auger. So keep that in mind, selective differential. And there's a look at lactose fermenters on the McConkie agar. You can see how purple they are. Those are all lactose fermenters. Hecto and enteric is specifically used just for salmonella and shigella. As a result, that's selective. So it's only allowing the growth of gram-negatives, 
like salmonella and shigella to grow. And then it's differential because they will base them on their fermentation. Both shigella and salmonella are non-fermenters. So they will, on the HE auger, be blue-green. That is the color they will show up on the HE auger. Salmonella also has the uniqueness in that it produces a gas called H2S, and that is seen as a black precipitate. So sometimes when you go to read these colonies on the auger plate, you might see a black center, and that would be something that salmonella is known to do. There's a few others that do it as well, but not a ton. So here's an example of what the HE auger looks like with those blue-green colonies of basically your negative, oh goodness, negative blue-green colonies of salmonella and shigella, which are non-fermenters. Okay, that's what I meant. And if it was salmonella growing, it would have maybe a black precipitate dot to it as well. All right, XLD is xylose lysine D succinate. Oh, that's a terrible word. This is again the same purpose as HE. So this will also only grow shigella and salmonella. So it is selective and differential. So selective for growing just those two. Differential because again on the fermentation. Shigella and salmonella are non-fermenters, so they will have colorless colonies on the XLD auger. Again, salmonella will have a black center due to that H2S production. So there it's kind of showing the black precipitation on the top part from salmonella. But you can see all those colorless colonies on the bottom. Gram-negative broth does exactly what it says. It only wants to grow gram-negatives. It is a liquid broth, so this would be selective. It's selectively only growing gram-negatives. Um, not a ton of places use this. I never use this when I was a micro, but there's other places that probably do easily. Just depends on what they have for setup. All right, we're getting there. We're getting closer, I promise. Sayer Martin is our next auger, and that will purposefully look for just Neisseria. And so Neisseria is fastidious, so it has to be an enriched auger. And then because it's only growing Neisseria, it's selective. So Thayer Martin is selective and enriched. And it will have four different antibiotics in it to make sure nothing else grows on that auger plate except Neisseria. And you do have to remember all of these. So in Thayer Martin, the colistin is added to inhibit gram negatives. Vancomycin is added to inhibit gram positives. Nystatin is added to inhibit yeast. And finally, mesoprim is added to inhibit a certain bacteria called Proteus. So there is a different auger called Martin Lewis. Again, we'd only have one of these in the lab. They do the same thing. Martin Lewis also looks for just Neisseria to grow. So again, it's enriched and selective. And it has the same antibiotics. It has colistin. It has higher amounts of vancomycin. It has trimethoprim. And then it uses um, mycin instead of nystatin to inhibit the yeast. So that's the biggest change between Thayer Martin and Martin Lewis, is that Martin Lewis will use mycin instead of nystatin, and then it has a higher amount of vancomycin. Now, the way that I always remember that Thayer Martin and Martin Lewis grow Neisseria is one of the main pathogens of Neisseria is gonorrhea. So I always think the two Martins have gonorrhea. I don't know. There's actually a third auger that I do not make, you know, called New York City auger that also grows Neisseria. So I used to say the two Martins went to Neisseria, went to New York City and got gonorrhea. It just linked in my head for me to remember that their use is specifically for Neisseria. But the, this, for the antibiotics, is pure memorization, unfortunately. Okay, so we've learned all the augers that we need to learn for now. We'll add to this list as we learn different bacteria. But those are the augers you need to know. You need to know what categories they fit into, a little bit on their purpose and anything else that we might have mentioned on them. Now, when you actually go to streak out an auger plate to grow bacteria, there is a special way in which to streak out auger plates to use so that you're not overly crowding and growing too much out, so that you have what we call isolation. Isolation means you have individual colonies that you can look at, that they're not all stacked up on each other so you don't know what you have. So your lab instructors will really help teach you how to properly streak out an auger plate so that you can get isolation. This is the primary technique here that's shown 
It's usually four quadrants that you're streaking out. You always have your primary one, which has the most stuff in it, and then you kind of have your secondary third. So you can see how it gets to be less and less as you streak out down to the fourth quadrant. And again, we're looking for isolation. If you look at that bottom picture, I can see, I know it's not zoomed in, I can see that there's definitely individual colonies there for me to work with. You want to make sure if you're testing that you truly know what colonies you're picking up. Now, there is a special way to plate if you are growing urine cultures. All other cultures are going to use the quad method here. Urine cultures use this method. So they will use a special loop that's been calibrated. You dip it into the urine and you streak it once down the center of the plate and then back and forth as many times as you can across the surface. So it's fairly easy to plate. So you can see a live example here on the right side. That's a McConkey auger that they have done that with. So once down the center and then back and forth as many times as you can. The reason we use a calibrated loop is that when you go to test the urine culture, you're counting how many colonies you have present. Of course, we can't count all of these colonies that would be insane, but you're giving a guesstimate like, oh, greater than 100,000 colonies per, you know, whatever. So that is why we use a calibrated loop. We want to get a count on it. So we'll go into more in urine cultures, but you should know how to plate these and you'll start practicing that soon. All right, when you grow them out and you incubate them and come back and take them out of the incubator, you have to look at their morphology when they grow that plate. Did they have a hemolysis? Were they beta hemolytic or alpha hemolytic? What color was it? You know, what size was it? All of this is going to go into the description of their colony morphologies. Again, remember what type of media you're viewing. If you're looking at a CNA plate, you should be thinking in your head, this is probably a gram positive because CNA only grows gram positive. So type of media will also help you determine. So here's different things that we put into place with colony characteristics. Again, we are going to gram stain every colony. And then we're going to identify. Once we determine a bacteria is definitely a pathogen, that it's there in enough volume, there's nothing else there, we will test it. And we will determine what antibiotic it can use and what the bacteria was. If there seems to be a ton of different types of colonies, that's usually a sign there's many different types of bacteria, which is typically contamination. So, all right, so there's your things that will go into identifying a bacteria, your colony morphology, your gram stain results, your biochemical test, which we'll learn as we go learning bacteria, and then finally, the overall identification and sensitivity. Sensitivity is referring to antibiotic susceptibility testing. So in other words, what antibiotics would be good for the patient to take, which ones is the bacteria resistant against. Anytime we identify bacteria, we are also giving the physician their antibiotic susceptibility test results so that the physician knows if I place the, this patient on a certain medicine and all of a sudden it shows up the bacteria is resistant, they can quick switch that patient to a different medicine that would work better. Oh my gosh, I'm tired. I'm sure you're exhausted listening to me if I have anybody left out there. But that is it for this week. Again, no quiz this week. Next week will be your first quiz over weeks one and two material. You guys have done great on your week one assignments. Um, I'm really pleased. So I think you'll be fine. But let me know if you have questions or anything. I mean, I know this was a ton of information. As we go, though, it won't be quite as much in the future. So that is it. Otherwise, have a great night. And thank you so much for those that did stick with me. I appreciate it.